Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Some of you probably know me. I'm Alan Rosenblum. I'm a professor of architecture, history, and architecture and design. And it's my great pleasure tonight to introduce our very important lecture. What will it take to design, build, and operate the next generation city? What is the future of our urban spaces? post-pandemic and post-oil, which will, which will be healthier, greener, and enhance urban resilience. In terms of a changing profession, transforming society, and a warming climate, Professor Stefan Lehmann will present strategies for urban transformation, health, and way of living. His latest books relevant to this keynote address include Informality to Sustainability, Routledge, London 2021, an Urban Regeneration, a Manifesto, Paul Grave Macmillan, London, 2019. Dr. Stefan Lehmann, born in Stuttgart, Germany, is an internationally recognized educator, scholar, author, designer, researcher, and strategic leader. He is a professor of architecture and urbanism at UNLV and the former director of schools of architecture, including the UNLV School of Architecture in Las Vegas and the School of Built Environment in Perth, Australia, since 2002. He has been a tenured full professor in a range of leadership roles at four research intensive universities on three continents, in the US, the UK, and Australia. Currently, he is director of the Interdisciplinary Urban Futures Lab and CEO of the Future Cities Leadership Lab where he is developing with his research group, with researchers group, architectural and urban solutions for transforming society and a warming climate. He has published 22 books and over 400 papers on the relationship between architecture and climate change. In the 1990s, he coined the notion of green urbanism. Before joining UNLV, Stefan Lehmann was the chairholder of the UNESCO Chair for Sustainable Urban Development for the Asia Pacific region. Stefan became a licensed architect in Berlin in January 1993 when he founded Stefan Lehmann Architecten and Städtebau, GmbH, as a collective interdisciplinary practice engaged in research and design. After completing a master's degree in Mainz, Germany in 1988, he graduated with a, diploma, with a AA diploma from the Architectural Association School in London in 1991 and later completed a PhD in architecture and urbanism at the Technical University in Berlin in 2003. He looks back at 30 years of experience in practice. With Professor Igor Peraza, he has recently established SI Architecture and Urban Design in Dubai and Barcelona with the ambitious aim to design and build the world's most sustainable projects. Please help me welcome Dr. Stefan Lem. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Good evening. Thank you for coming to the first in-person lecture after what? Two years? Oh my God. <laughs> so this is really something to celebrate, not because I'm giving the lecture, but you are seeing each other again in real person. How fantastic is that? So let's give it a applause. <laughs> send this pandemic packing. <laughs> okay, so such a great pleasure to be here. I've been here talking 10 years ago, and I've been here talking 20 years ago. So I was joking earlier, I will come back in 10 years, see you then. But I hope it doesn't take that long, of course. So um, I want to just talk a little bit about my journey and what, we brought, what brought me here, and then also about, of course, the, the main core theme, the next generation city, so it's about the climate crisis and what architects can do, and then looking ahead uh, and consider um, a challenge, what if, uh, with some provocative thoughts. Of course, we all know cities grow, cities consume, and cities are the center of consumption and greenhouse gas emissions. Um, here, for instance, we see that the energy consumption of cities is 80%, and the greenhouse gas emissions is somewhere 60 to 80 percent of all um, all things considered in designing and building cities. 35 percent of all greenhouse gas emissions in the San Diego region come from transport, from driving private cars. So there's a huge 
huge opportunity to change that by changing mobility, mobility behavior, uh, behavior of not seating one person per car alone in the car. That's of course ca causing all those traffic jams, as you all will agree. And I believe there's more good news coming and there's reason to celebrate because the US infrastructure package has been approved finally and we have to be very ambitious. If you think about only by 2004, China has started to develop its high speed rail and now you can take the rail with 350 kilometer an hour. What is that? Maybe um, 250 miles an hour. Anyway, extremely fast <laughs> train and only in a very short time change can happen. Just imagine we finally get that fast train connection between San Francisco and Los Angeles and maybe even continuing all the way down to San Diego. How fantastic would that be? China is now thinking about fast trains of 600 kilometer per hour connecting Shanghai with Beijing, which is which is pretty impressive. CO2 emissions have been growing. We knew this for a long time. Actually, there is research that has been done over 100 years ago on climate change and it hasn't been taken serious and it has been ignored for much a long time. But against the backdrop of the COP26 in Glasgow, just finishing the climate summit, I think we have all reasons to be optimistic. And I spoke earlier to the students. I was very impressed by the students. It's always wonderful, wonderful to meet other students, for instance, um, here at uh, the New School, I found the students very smart, very good questions. And I, I believe that we have reasons to be optimistic because there is a huge movement, maybe humanity's fast, uh, largest, largest movement, humanity's largest movement in terms of people on the street asking for change. Citizens want to change and they want it now and they don't want to wait any further. And to fix the climate crisis is now clearly the most important topic for us as architects and to con uh, contribute and participate in what we can do. The second is also the availability of the technology and the cost of this technology like solar power, much more affordable, photovoltaic panels. And we also cannot postpone it any longer. This is a slide that um, shows you what's happening if you ignore and keep pretending everything is all right and business as usual is good enough. It is of course not. And the relationship between different city concepts that have emerged just over the last years is very exciting. We always used to call it the sustainable city, the green city, the ecological city, but now there are many, many different fine differences between, between the circular city, the resilient city, the resource efficient city and other types of cities that focus on different areas. But of course, it's all about how can we change, transform the existing city to make it more sustainable and more energy efficient and more resourceful. And there are all the different areas that we can look at from behavior change to waste generation, to energy consumption, to water management, to mobility. Um, and this is, of course, part of your studies. I always think it's common design sense and I'm shocked about what happens, what is proposed for uh, the University of California, Santa Barbara, with a building that supposedly 95% of all rooms have no windows. I'm sure you are following what's discussed at the moment. There is a present, there's a Trojan horse present for the USA Santa Barbara for 4,500 students. It's called Munger Hall and it looks like it might go ahead. It might even get built. It's a nine story, huge, massive block where uh, students are supposedly to live in residences without fresh air, without a view, without even daylight. And a lot of people are joking that this reminds them of Squid Game and the way people are staying at Squid Game. <laughs> so tight and so close and so uh, without daylight, of course. But our agenda has never been as clear as it is today, I believe. It is very clear what is lacking is political will and leadership. Most of the time, our political will is just not there. It's just not good enough. Uh, and I'm a little bit still scratching my head, walking around downtown San Diego and having been here um, you know, last night when I arrived, I walked around and I saw a lot of a lot of high rise towers that have recently popped up in a very short time frame. You know, when you come here 
um, and you haven't been here for a couple of years, you see the transformation and the transition of downtown, but not going in the right direction. I would say that there are a lot of not very high quality apartment towers rising, popping up almost overnight here in downtown. And you do not have any improvement of public space. And today I would like to talk about public space and the need for having better public space, especially as we see downtown transforming in such a fast speed where a couple of people obviously make a lot of money out of downtown and the public space quality has not held up. It's not acceptable, I believe, that downtown is um, is getting transformed in that way. And I think you as a school, new school must be up in arms and you must call it out and you must call for better, more ambitious plans for your downtown because it's just not acceptable. You have the authenticity of the old factory warehouses disappearing, they get knocked down, but you don't have better green space. You don't have, in fact, any much green space happening. Uh, that was promised years ago. We don't see much street tree planting. We don't see community gardens. Every of those towers must deliver social benefits and public space improvement. Otherwise, why would you want them? Why would you agree to those high rise towers? In fact, 20 years ago, I started to look into that and explore research that is thinking about what is the best density and how can we do urban infill without building 30, 40 story towers? It's what I called density without high rise. We want density. We need density because density is actually good. It creates urbanity. It makes the place walkable, mixed use and compact. It's reducing the need to drive and it's um, creating all kinds of other advantages. It, cre it could create a sustainable city. But as we become more dense in downtown, we also at the same time must become more green. Dense and green go together well. It's not a contradiction. Every, every increase of density must at the same time increase the access to green space. The green space can be maybe on the roof, maybe roof gardens. It could be um, in the backyard behind the building. And those buildings don't have to be 30, 40 story. We found in our research that the most sustainable model is actually a density between four and seven stories. Four and seven stories. If you do four or five stories, you might even do walk-ups. You might not need elevators, but you want to have good density. Density without high rise, we call it. And I think that's now more important than ever before. Density without high rise. But we need leadership and we need the school to be active and to influence the development of downtown San Diego. Everything I've been doing the last years is kind of following Peter Eisenman's advice, who said, if you want to be a real architect, you have to be involved and active in all three domains. You're going to have to be involved in research, teaching and practice, because the way research, teaching and practice overlaps and combines, you want to have your projects here. You don't want to just do practice alone, knowledge application. You also don't want to just do teaching alone, knowledge transfer. Ideally, you want to do knowledge generation in research and then bring it together. And it took me a long time. It took me 30 years to be at the point where I believe we can now integrate the theory into the practice with the new firm. I'm going to talk a little bit about what we are doing with SI architecture. And we are doing what we call research informed design. So research is important, it's essential for innovation, and it's informing design for better decision making, but also for better design solutions. And it's very important that when you work, you always think about those three domains and how they interact with each other, because you want to open up those silos. You don't want to be stuck in, let's say, the urban design or the architecture or the product design silo. You want to collaborate and innovative projects do not happen in silos. You have to be collaborative in a fast changing context. So I believe the future that you will work in is all about innovation and collaboration. That's very clear, very clear. It's becoming more and more, uh, it's emerging more and more clearly. And I, over the last years, I established a series of research centers, research institutes, for instance, a think tank in the UK called the Cluster for Sustainable Cities and a think tank in Las Vegas of all places learning from Las Vegas called the Urban Futures Lab. 
and how they work together involving 40 researchers across a range of disciplines, not just architects, urban planners, but economists, uh, computer scientists, and so on, uh, biologists. And we are trying to rethink architecture for the age of global warming. It's very exciting to be brave and bold and ambitious and think forward what needs to happen now in the next years. When Le Corbusier was asked if he could give any advice to architecture students what they should do, he said to be an architect, you need to do two things. You need to travel and to read books. He didn't say many books and he didn't say what kind of books, but he said read books and travel. That was the advice. He didn't say you have to go to school. <laughs> Maybe something changed. He didn't say you have to have drafting tools. He didn't say you need to learn about the building code or the fashions of architecture. He said travel and reading. Very interesting. Of course, we all agree that this is an outdated idea of the single architect standing somewhere trying to be um, the lonely uh, creative person at that point. The image of an architect, 1893. Of course, a profession that is so old like ours, almost 5,000 years old, and it's constantly evolving. And I believe today we see architecture as a profession that can really enable engagement and social change. A driver we call architects agents of change or public intellectuals. We also see new models of engagement emerging, what constitutes critical practice today and what is research informed practice. And of course, the United Nations 17 sustainability goals are very important for us as an analytical framework in which we operate and we have SDG Sustainable Development Goal 11, particularly concerned about sustainable cities and communities, very important. At the beginning, when there were only 15 SDGs, they didn't want to have an SDG on cities. And only at the last minute, SDG of cities was put in there, uh, which, is, which has proven to be very good because of this urbanization and the increasing power and meaning of cities replacing nation states, it's fair enough to have a special sustainable development goals that just thinks about sustainability of cities. But one question here is how much time is left until we reach a tipping point? We are somewhere here today and some scientists say it's less than 10 years, less than 10 years. So now on the back of the climate summit and of course the Paris Agreement and all those good things happening, I believe we can fix it and I'm very optimistic, but there is not much time left. We cannot keep dragging our feet and kicking down the can and prolonging this any longer to make sure we're not reaching the point of no return where we have a tipping point where the temperatures, the warming up of the climate is escalating in a way that um, it is going to result in more than 1.5 degrees Celsius global warming. That would be disastrous because the 1.5 degrees Celsius only means an average. In some areas, it's going to be four or five degrees Celsius, which is four degrees Celsius is possibly nine degree Fahrenheit or even more, you know, so a significant increase of endurance, endurance of heat waves. So what are the real issues? We all are concerned about the loss of biodiversity, the species extinction, but also how cities keep growing. It's in one way it's good because cities grow. These are the chop motors, engines, and there will be more and more job opportunities. And they create the economy creates, of course, more opportunities for others. But we need to have a gross boundary. The cities cannot endlessly increase the footprint. How large do you want San Diego to be? Uh, it's already called a hundred mile city, as you will know. Several people have written about San Diego. Los Angeles, the urban region of no boundary where you spend two, three hours every day in a car. That can't be the future. So we need a we need a gross, a really, really meaningful, strict gross boundary to protect and conserve the land. Instead of increasing the footprint and keep further sprawling, we need to densify and keep the city footprint compact and say instead of decompacting, we recompacting the city. We have outdated urbanization models, zoning laws. We put housing here and working over there for the last 50, 60 years 
And now we know it's been a mistake. We have to mix use. We have to bring and mix it up. We have to bring people to live where they work and to work where they live and to have short distances, what some people call now the 15 minute city, the city of short distances. Very important um, in Las Vegas. We are completely car dependent, I must admit. Um, it's there is almost no public transport. There is no chance to ride a bike. Let's let's be let's 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 be honest. It's half the year. It's too hot, and the distances are too big. So I'm a, I'm a big believer in e-bikes. As long as your electricity comes from solar power, I think the e-bike is a good vehicle uh, because it helps you to get further. But we need to think about density without high rise, city of short distances, the green urbanism principles, and the zero waste city and the polycentric city. Those are the topics I want to talk and spend a little bit more time over the next 20 minutes. And then, of course, we have questions if you have any happy to answer questions. So we need to stop building in nature. If you love nature, don't build in it. Don't live in it. Maintain it, keep it and protect it. We cannot have the notion, the paradigm of a sustainable house somewhere in the forest or in beautiful green field landscape. This is not, this is the wrong paradigm. This is not possible anymore. What, for instance, uh, glossy magazines try to sell the idea of a sustainable house built somewhere at an exclusive um, point within the green landscape. It's not acceptable. We have to densify and we have to stay and build in the city. And all land that is not built on at the moment should be protected, of course. And we have to change our we have to reverse our belief system. We are not separate from nature. You see the old idea that humankind is at the top and all nature is there to be exploited, which is the origin from René Descartes, uh, the philosopher of the 17th century. Supposedly humans are superior and there to exploit nature. We have to reverse the idea because humanity is not there to dominate. It's part of the same ecosystem. That's very important. Oops, I pressed something. Oh, to move from ego to eco is very important and to transform the existing cities by making them more compact, mixed use and walkable. But please not like we have seen here recently in downtown San Diego. Um, we published a lot on that. It was mentioned a lot of books. Uh, you will find some in the library here also uh, research. I call it with real impact. Every book is coming out actually of a need to produce some resource and something for the students to teach them better. This is always the driver for the books. One is uh, the principles of green urbanism. There is now also a Chinese uh, version, I believe, and there is a book series I do for Routledge, which we just added informality, looking at informal cities. The key books that you can find in the library is the principles of green urbanism, the low carbon cities book and the growing compact, which deals about what kind of density we should have and how far, how dense we don't want to have Hong Kong or Mumbai densities, of course, and also the manifesto for urban regeneration. Most of the work of the architect in the future will be about repurposing and adaptive reuse of existing buildings. We have to much more value what is already there for its embodied energy. Uh, the most sustainable building by far is the one that already exists. It's not a little bit more sustainable. It's much more sustainable. So keeping as much as you can. And it was with great interest to see that the Pritzker Prize winners recently, Lacaton and Vassal from France, they say never demolish anything. Keep everything you can. And that's their principle, their philosophy in their office. So being also a teacher, educator for 30 years now, what I always say, we need to prepare students for an uncertain future and to be a strategic designer, strategic, and not tell the students what to think. We don't do that. We tell them how to think critically and involve them in real world projects. That's very important. We try to do this as much as possible where theory and practice comes together and hits the road. This is the way forward. But are we asking the right questions? I always like to show Richard Buckminster Fuller and he always nerfed everybody by asking his question. 
Are we wasting our time or are we focusing on the really essential right questions? And he was, of course, always a futurist ahead of his time. So when the last two years, Igor Perez Peraza, who is a Barcelonian architect from Spain and a professor in Dubai, in Sharjah, the American University there, so always between Dubai and Barcelona. And I, we remember that when we were much younger, we were working together 32 years ago in Arata Isosaki's office in Tokyo. And he said, you know what? You're the man I trust the most. And I know you're a fantastic architect. Why don't we work together? And we said, let's create a new firm. And Igor turned 60. I'm turning 60 next year, by the way. And so we said, OK, we have we have an opportunity to work together finally. You know, it took us over 30 years to get to that point. So when you make friends at university or at your first job, remember it could be a friendship for life. And you might maybe 30 years later form a, a firm, a company. And we call it Stefan and Igor SI Architecture and Urban Design. That's our idea because we want it very personal. We don't want to have a huge firm. We want to stay personally involved in the work. And we want to just do high quality buildings and projects that are the most sustainable projects and be very passionate about sustainability. And now we want to bring this theory into practice. And maybe we can do five, six, seven buildings, you know, not more, but we want to work with very carefully selected clients doing something extraordinary at the end of our careers and spend the time wisely after, you know, having run offices in Barcelona and Berlin and doing a lot of commercial work and doing everything and, you know, doing all kinds of things and also teaching a lot. Now we came at a point where we say we want to have a new type of firm and what kind of firm is needed. So we strategized, we sought very hard for a year. What kind of firm is needed in the world? There's a saturation of architects. There are lots of architects and we don't want to just have any firm. So we said, OK, we bring together all our knowledge and our friendship to SI architecture. And here's a one off chance we have one off chance. So we said there should be a unique approach. It should be driven by research. Research informed design is the number one. The second is it should be all about collaboration and it should be about interdisciplinary collaboration, working with the best engineers and landscape architects and other people in the world. And it must show leadership in sustainability. Otherwise, we don't want to touch it. We don't want to do it anymore. We don't want to be servant of some commercial greed driven project. We don't want to waste our time on this anymore. We try to do very sustainable projects or not. And also it must start with the public space with the urban design. The urban design comes first. Before we talk about architecture, we must make sure the geometry, the orientation, the location, the density, it is all ticking all boxes. Otherwise, it's just not right. And we want to bring the academic work, our teaching, our professorships into the work, and we want to integrate innovation. And it's easier said than done, of course, but these are the driving principles of what we believe is the practice of the future. And we work in Barcelona, in Dubai, and of course there's a lot of traveling also, uh, but we do a lot online and we have teamed up with partners in different places, but we just want to have the two offices, the Dubai and Barcelona office, and we work in different areas that we have experience. And I'm just showing some of my work and I fl fly through because I don't want to really present buildings, you know, I want to talk with you about concepts and I want to talk with you uh, about to you about innovation and discuss innovation and collaboration. This is a project I did as a young man at Potsdamer Platz in Berlin. It's a big machine. My first job in my office I set up was not an extension to the house of my mother. It was a $400 million um, office building at Potsdamer Platz in Berlin after the wall came down, which was very exciting um, to think about. And in fact, if you know Wim Wenders and his movie, the sky above Berlin, the Himmel über Berlin, very interesting movie. And this was exactly the site where we built this office building, which has a garden in the center. It's connected by bridges. It has an interesting facade. And then we won other competitions. We did uh, in my office in Berlin, we did the um, infill project of five buildings at Hackischer Markt. We did the 40 meter tower 
for the association of German banks with a lot of competitions, high rise buildings. We won some, but they never got built. We did housing villas. We did one off houses like this house that won a couple of awards, a timber house, floating timber box with an interesting roof section in Frankfurt. We did then with Christian de Portsum Park, we teamed up in partnership. We did the French embassy in Berlin, which was a very prestigious large project also with very beautiful fit out, not only the embassy, but also the residence of the ambassador. Um, and then we did a lot of sustainable urbanism, a lot of master planning in Australia, for instance, Australia's first low to no carbon urban design master plans for different cities. And at the moment we are working on a couple of interesting projects now in Riyadh, in Dubai and in Barcelona. I'm just trying to show the one in Barcelona. Barcelona has the problem that it needs more housing. It needs affordable housing. And so we have a quite high density plan, 400 apartments, 60,000 square meter, what's that, 600,000 square feet in six new buildings and one existing building. We keep, we maintain one existing factory and we have a high rise building here and all six new buildings are built, will be built in timber, in mass engineered timber. And we're working on this right now. Very interesting where we think about modular prefabrication and new housing types that have home offices. After the pandemic, every unit type must have a home office. That's clear. And also the green space. We create a new two hectare park right next to um, right next to the building. There is a new two hectare, uh, quite significant public space here, a new square and a series. And this is all public housing. Um, to a very tight budget, of course, but with prefabrication, with prefabrication, if you have modular mass timber construction and you have a high repetition of the same module and the same detailing, the costs can come down. Otherwise not. Otherwise, the costs are similar to building in concrete. Mass timber construction is not cheaper. Only if you have the advantage of a high repetition of a similar module, then you can um, of course, take advantage from the scale of the project. So what I'm really interested in is having a discussion about the public space network. We believe today the most relevant issue of the city is the public space network. If you want to make it safe and enjoyable for walking and cycling, you're going to have to upgrade the public space. Very important. And the question then, of course, is what is the collective realm? Who owns the city? Who is the public? All those questions that come with it. And of course, the public space has totally changed with the emergence of things like entertainment on TV and the Internet. This public space is gone. But how can we regain the quality and how can we regain all those things that we have become aware through the pandemic? How wonderful it is to have a window looking out on the street or a balcony to, to step out, fresh air, a lot of daylight and even access to a green space. We reappreciate those very simple pleasures that architects have totally forgotten about, I must say. So we talk about the spectrum of public space that is truly public or semi-public, but not private and not quasi-private, like the Strip in Las Vegas is entirely privately owned. You probably know that. The Strip is in a part called Paradise, which has never been incorporated. It's not part of the city of Las Vegas. It's run by companies like Caesar Palace and um, Wynn and other and MGM. And they share and they own this public space. They police it, they control it, they maintain it, and they own it, and they renew it, and they invest in it. But it's all about consumption. It's all about consumption and consuming and selling a certain quasi public space to the public, but it's not really truly public. So we need to think about the true public space for the urban collective and the qualities that were described by many writers, French writers, Guy de Maupassant or Victor Hugo or Marcel Brust and Charles Baudelaire that wrote explicitly in many books about the flaneur and the quality of walking and the walkable city. And I'm sure you know about, you know, the city as a stage of its urban life, as as um, urbanity to be watched and observed. Um, Walter Benjamin wrote about philosopher Walter Benjamin. But of course, this is the reality that you get when you hand over the responsibility of the public space 
to, let's say, a traffic engineer, you get a lot of asphalt, you get wonderful driving curves, but there is not much green space or space to walk left. And this is not the future. We can't have that. We also need to stop thinking about everybody is 25 years old and athletic. That's not the case. We have to think about how old people and young people, children use the public space. Very, very important uh, for the different groups to cater and to make a true public space, a civic space that caters for everybody, how old people like to meet. And this is very important, of course. So we need to think and consider this. And also indigenous groups, photo I took in India, of course, Women in India have a long tradition of thousands of years meeting and sitting together on the ground and discussing issues. And they meet, but now with the overburden of the air pollution and traffic congestion in all Indian cities, Indian women cannot meet anymore. It's, it's lost, but there's no other way for people to meet because it's given, handed over to the automobile and now we see counter movements. We see everywhere counter movements making the city, give the city back to cycling and walking and making it cyclable, compact and mixed use, not only in Copenhagen or Amsterdam or Stockholm, like this photo, but also everywhere we have movements where cyclists and pedestrians reclaim the city, but therefore the urban space, the public space network needs to be looked at. And if you want, improvement here, you're going to have to work on that. And to do this, the way forward as a city like San Diego keeps growing as a, above a certain point, I think you have to move from a monocentric model to a polycentric model where you have many sub centers. For instance, that could be downtown and then the other centers, Boboa Park and so on, Corona Island. And then how do you interconnect those with effective public transport, carbon free. And what is this public transport? It's maybe some new green tram or sky train or super green buses that don't exist yet. You have to really invent this low carbon, zero carbon mobility and connect the polycentric city with each other, with those clusters. And that's the future. That's when you want to have a walkable city because everybody lives and works in their clusters and you don't need to leave because you don't have working here and living here. You have a mix and you can walk to the pub or the cinema or the shop um, and you can also drive of course but hopefully with a completely uh, carbon free car. Um, also those small public spaces are extremely important and we don't see enough of them. Every high rise tower that's been created in downtown San Diego should have created a couple of those pocket parks, community gardens, hangout places, and they don't have to be very large. They can be quite small, discreet, intimate. But of course, you can also have larger ones like Central Park, New York, and we see now how people differently use Central Park in the pandemic. We learned a lot from the pandemic. Let's not forget that. Let's not just go back to business as usual, but remember the learnings we had and see what other cities have been doing and how cities can allow for informality and for informal use. And of course, people always say it can't be done here. It cannot be done in San Diego. San Diego is not Copenhagen. <laughs> you hear this all the time, I guess, you know, but remember Amsterdam, for instance, one of the most walkable, livable cities now, only 40 years earlier looked like that. Everywhere was car parking space. You couldn't walk. P pavements were very narrow. It was all handed over hopelessly. It's the same street 40 years later. And what did Amsterdam? Against all odds and people saying it can't happen in Amsterdam, they did it gradually. And you gradually take out car parking space. Every year you secretly take out 2% of the car parking space. So people don't even realize, but they realize it's getting harder and harder to park in the city center. And next time they take the bus or the bike or they walk. And it's very interesting if you do that slowly, car parking spaces disappear. And you start with 20 over there and five over here and 10 there. And every year you do a little bit more and, and step by step, you arrive at a situation where you have a light railway, you have very wide pavement, very safe and comfortable to walk. You see how many people you have cycling paths, very safe and secure to cycle. 
and it's a very enjoyable public space network. And then, of course, you have also space to plant trees, which Amsterdam is doing now, by the way. I believe here are more trees now in the meantime. So very interesting. We need to we need to, of course, plant many more trees and have green roofs and so on. And those small green spaces work very well. This is a plan of London that you will recognize with the Thames. And you see the many, many, many small green spaces and larger parks, Hyde Park, for instance, here, but many small green spaces that make the wonderful livability and character of the city of London and the high quality of walking around and living in London. And why do we have to do it? There are other reasons, not just because we like to look at trees, which is beautiful anyway, but the right species of tree, which has large leaves, big crowns and keeps the urban heat island, the dangerous urban heat island low. The urban heat island, as you all know, is the difference between the temperature difference between the suburb and the core and where we see a nighttime phenomenon where the city does not cool down anymore at nighttime because there is a heat wave and after a couple of hot days, the, heat, the nights do not cool down, do not flush cool anymore, but they, they build up and the city stores more and more heat. It becomes like a baking oven. So when you open up your window in the morning, it's not fresh air that comes in, but it's still the heat from the day before. And to avoid that, we, meet, we need to build the city in different materials and different surfaces to make sure cities do not heat up like baking, baking ovens and do not absorb all the uh, solar radiation. And there are a lot of ways to do that. One is, for instance, green pillars, like here in Mexico City, every pillar under the freeway is a vertical green wall that binds the dust, improves the urban microclimate, cleans the air. Also, urban forests, like here in Melbourne, very, very successful. And it's always a good figure. You should have at least 250 square feet per resident of open green space but it needs to be close by. It needs to be easily accessible wherever you are. You shouldn't be more than five minutes away from a green space. And of course, the way we deal with water needs to be different. We introduce biofiltration swales that can store water runoff, stormwater runoff, rainwater, but also uh, harvest, store and clean by biofiltration naturally the water and some of it allows it to penetrate down to the groundwater. Very important. We cannot have permeable sealed uh, surfaces. The, the whole idea and attitude towards public space needs to change towards productive landscapes that not only generate energy like here, this big solar power roof in Barcelona, but also produce food, clean water and be productive in other ways. And if you if you heat map the city, like we've done a big research study on different cities and compare a comparative study uh, and what can be done to keep the city cooler. It's very obvious that if you have a concrete roof, you get a very hot area in summer that just gets hotter and hotter. And instead, you should have green roofs and you should take advantage of the ecosystem services for flood control, for shade, shadow, humidity, for the water cycle, for biodiversity, and all those things that come for free with green roofs and um, with ecosystem services. And therefore, we do a lot of study on the albedo effect. What is the reflective quotient of surfaces? The worst you can have is black asphalt. And you know this in the summer time, in a heat period, when you walk over a car park and there is no tree and it's really, it's really 110 Fahrenheit and it's really hot. Uh, something we get very common, of course, in Las Vegas or in Phoenix or, or in Albuquerque and El Paso. And those cities have the biggest urban heat island. The worst urban heat island of all American cities is in Las Vegas. And Las Vegas is the fastest warming city of all cities by far. The second fastest warming city is El Paso in Texas. So we, we compare the different gradient. What is it if you have a green roof, if you have snow, a white surface and so on? And it's very obvious that when you have roof gardening, it keeps the city cool, but also the building underneath and you have much less solar gain and therefore your air conditioned plant doesn't have to be so big, but can be reduced and emits le much less greenhouse gas emissions. And another issue, of course, that 
has to be discussed is the global supply chain of materials and products. We have to purchase power. As architects, we can influence this by specifying buildings and how we specify buildings, what kind of materials we select, what kind of products we select. The global supply chain that has somewhere an impact, maybe on the other side of the globe. And is it ethical? Is there child labor? But also what are the greenhouse gas emissions from transport? What is the embodied energy, not just carbon from operation, but embodied energy is very, very important. So what happens usually, let's say an architect in Berlin specifies a stone facade, selects a stone from Brazil, for instance, the stone is getting cut in Brazil, and then it's getting shipped to China because in China it's the cheapest place to work on the surface and cut it up in detail and make the different uh, pieces for the facade and polish it. And then it gets shipped to Germany and trucked into Germany. And by the time a stone piece of cladding is hanging on the tower in Berlin, it has gone around the world and it has so much embodied energy and carbon that is just not possible. So we have to think of adaptive reuse, repurposing existing buildings, but also where do those products and materials come from, from um, sourcing them somewhere in a quarry maybe, and then, or in a mining situation, and then make them and then dispose them. This linear throwaway um, attitude is just not possible. So zero waste to landfill is what we're trying to do in our projects now. And as a closing reflection, I want to talk about just three points and then we might have some discussion, I hope. Um, first, I want to mention the rediscovery of the urban context. Really, really important. The end of the object of the self-referential architectural object. Second is the disappearance of the public as a client is a big concern. We used to have the public, let's say a city would commission a building, a museum, a library. We hardly see this anymore. The public has disappeared. It's all handed over to the private sector. But if you put the private sector in charge of public space, what you get is something like the strip, which is all about consumption. And that's obviously not good. And the future practice, what kind of practice do we want to have as architects? And how can we impact and transform our profession in the way? What kind of architects do we have to have to lead solving the climate crisis? And what will we need to teach? And how is our education, our curriculum that has to change in the way and part of that is including the reinvention of public space. So first, the rediscovery of the public space and the urban context, what I call the end of the object. Architecture has moved away from object-based to process-based contextual approaches. We don't create freestanding single referential, self-referential objects anymore. We have shifted away from isolated um, autistic buildings. We want to have hybrid buildings. We want to have an ability to have spatial programming that is not just singular program, but is rich and complex to strengthen public space. Each building has the role to support and strengthen public space. That's the primary purpose of architecture, to strengthen and support public space. And so every project must start with the urban design and the public space quality. Like Richard Rogers says, architecture is about public space held by buildings. I love this quote. Also, a big concern is the disappearance of the public as a client. In the era of neoliberalism, the last 10, 20 years, we have witnessed a total commercialization and privatization of our public spaces. That's a large, con a big concern actually, because what used to be civic is disappearing and the social responsibility that architecture used to have is something that we need to re rediscover in our work. So we need innovative architecture at a time that provides good public space at a time when we need public buildings and public space more than ever before. The pandemic has made this very clear, I believe, and everywhere we see the public sector retreating and disappearing, which is an issue. The client of projects and owners of public space is the private sector taking over and they cannot deliver what used to be the custodian, the stewardship of inclusive urban space, which used to be the civic, the public, the city council or the state government. So there is evidence that large projects 
uh, very disappointing in terms of the public space they deliver. Every time we learn again and again the hard way, that's when, when those pa large public spaces uh, get finished, let's say Hudson Yards. Hudson Yards is, a, as you know, in New York City, a very new, just completed, largest public investment, uh, sorry, private investment, private development in the United States. $14 billion Hudson Yards. And basically, it's, it's a series of glass towers that don't talk to each other with windy public space in between. The public space has been totally forgotten. Then they try to fix this by commissioning people like Thomas Hetherick, who created an object and put it there. And it's it's kind of interesting in some way. What is if this is the tendency? I do not trust the private sector to bring back the quality of public space that we need to have. But how can we compensate for the loss of the public as a client? We can only act as representative of the people. The architects always have have been the representative of the people's interest. And so every project needs to deliver wider social benefits. Very, very important. And last not least, then, of course, the need for architects to be involved in solving the climate crisis. And there is so much we can do. I already mentioned uh, the way we specify, for instance, buildings and uh, the way we design. And the climate has already changed, as you know, but we can identify the privatization of public space, the increasing surveillance of public space, big concern, and also uh, design seams that employ seam park simulations um, that are not authentic, they break with local history. So how can public space become public again? And the studios I'm running at UNLV are all about public buildings, public space at the moment. And how can we regain the public and the civic, the quality of the civic that otherwise is getting lost, you know? And how can we train young architects to be able to participate in solving the climate crisis? And I believe the quality of public spaces and the network of public space is key here, is key. More than individual buildings, we need to design for a post-pandemic, post-oil climate change scenario where public space is the driver and the catalyst of that change. So that's maybe all I want to talk to you today. Uh, and we can, of course, talk a, a more in a discussion about that. If you have any questions, you can ask me what you like, uh, whatever you want. Thank you. So, thank you.